Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for this extended delay. We were having some technical difficulties. Uh, welcome, a warm welcome to all of you to this session on the basics of investing. Uh, my name is Muhammad Irfan, and I am a guest facilitator at BIBF at the Bahrain Institute of Banking and Finance. Once again, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, so let me, let me give you a brief of what we're going to do today. The objective of the session, as is clear from the title, is for all of us to understand the basics of investing. And before I move on to the next slide, which will show you our agenda for the day, uh, a couple of things. One, I would I want all of you to pay attention because at the end of this session, I'm going to ask you three questions. And the first three correct answers are entitled to win some exciting prizes courtesy BIBF. So I repeat, at the end of the session, I will ask three questions. You can chat and uh, relay the answers as a message. The first three correct answers, uh, sorry, the first correct answer for each question. So three questions, three winners. The first correct answer for each question will be entitled to a prize courtesy BIBF. Okay, great. So let me move into the second slide. Yeah. So as you can see, our agenda for today is to differentiate between saving and investing. Then I'm going to talk about some key investment principles. I'm going to go, go on forward and talk about how you develop your own investment goals. Then we're going to get a little technical, and I'm going to talk to you about what is the meaning of an asset class and a term called asset allocation. We're going to understand this today. Then again, we're going to have a little bit of an introduction to Bahrain Bourse. And that will be the end of the session, followed by a quick Q&A. So if you have any questions and answers, that will be the time you can post them to me. And once we're done with the Q&A, we will move on to the quiz, which will be three questions, as I just mentioned. Right? Before I move to the next slide, before I show you the definition of saving and investing and we talk about what the differences are, let me throw a few questions at you and make you think, right? whether we really understand these simple terms. We talk about saving, we talk about investing multiple times in our lives on a daily basis, right? These are common knowledge words. These are not technical words. By the way, I'm going to try and keep my presentation as simple and not use financial jargon and technical because this is a fundamental course. It's a basic course, an introduction to saving and investment, right? So let me ask you a few questions. All of us have some money lying in a bank account, right? Is that your saving or is that an investment? Let me throw a few more questions. All of us have cars. So the cars that you've bought, is that an investment or is it not an investment? Your wives, your daughters, your mothers, they've got some jewelry, right, made of gold. That gold jewelry that they have, is that an investment or is it not? Some of us own properties. We own apartments or houses or land. Is that an investment or not? Some of us who understand finance a little better and who have some experience in investing may have bought some mutual funds or we may have bought some stocks or some other form of investments, right? Is that an investment or not? So these are some questions that I want to throw at you and I want you to give it some thought. So I'm going to give you 20 to 30 seconds to process that and then I'm going to show you the next slide which will clarify the definition, the definition and the distinction between these two terms and then I'll explain forward. Abdurrahman, yeah. I can't see the screen here. Thank you. I hope you're thinking about the questions that I posed. I'll repeat those questions. The money that's in your bank account, is that your saving or is that an investment as well? The cars that we own, right? Your car, your wife's car, your brother's car, whichever car you own, is that an investment or is it not an investment? The properties that some of us own, is that an investment or not? The gold jewelry, is that an investment? Is there a difference between having gold jewelry and gold biscuits? Are they the same in terms of investment or is there a difference? When we buy stocks, when we buy uh, you know, mutual funds, etc., these kind of investments, is there a difference between buying a property versus buying a stock versus buying a car? versus buying gold? Is there a difference between any of these investments? I'll 
put forward one more question which I didn't say earlier. If you invest in a fixed deposit, some of us have FDs or fixed deposits in the banks, right? Is that a saving or is that a way of investing? So I repeat that question because it's an important question which we will discuss in more detail later on. The money that I have in a fixed deposit or an FD, will that be considered as my saving or will that be an investment and how is that any different from the other investments or other uh, opportunities that I spoke about right now? So I think you've had some time to think now. I'll move to the next slide. As you can see, there's a table on this slide and we will go through this. So let's start with the definition and then I'll answer the questions that I asked you, right? So if we look at the definition of savings and investing, it says savings is the portion of current income that is not spent on consumptions. So current income is the money that I'm earning right now. It could be a salary, it could be business income. Some of us are salaried, some of us have our own businesses, right? The money that we're earning right now, either from a salary or a business income, is called either a salary or an income. So my current income, out of that, we're spending some money, right? We're spending on rent, on fees, on food, on electricity, internet, mobile bills, so many things we spend money on. Whatever is left after that, that is what savings is. So that's what the definition is saying. The definition is saying portion of current income that is not spent on consumptions. Now coming to investing. Investing, the definition is purchase of an investment security or an investment instrument. There are various words you can call it. So purchase of an investment security or an investment in, uh, instrument with the objective of increasing future income. So here we're buying something. We're purchasing something. What are we buying? We're buying an investment instrument or an investment security. Why? What's our objective? We're hoping that our future income will increase. So either the value of that investment will go up in the future or the income that we can derive from it will increase in the future. So there's a difference between saving and investment. And it's clear, they're two completely different things. Savings is the money that I have left after whatever I spend on during a month. Now, whatever I spend on could include investment also. Maybe I've got a salary of, let's say, 2,000 dinars. Out of that, every month, rent, fees, food, electricity, mobile, whatever, right? 1,000 dinar goes. I've got 1,000 left. And I also decide every month, out of the 1,000 that I am left with, I'm going to invest 300 somewhere. Let's not get into where. Somewhere, every month 300 BD I decide to invest. So that is also a consumption. Now what I'm left with after that, that's 700. That is my saving. Whereas investment is the amount that you put into an instrument or a security, hoping that it will increase in value in the future or it will give you an increased income in the future. So that's the distinction between investment and saving. So now let us go back to my questions, right? I asked you the money sitting in your accounts. I'm sure all of you very clearly will understand by now that that is nothing but savings, right? That money is not there for it to grow into something bigger, right? That's your saving. If you buy a car, is that a saving is a question I had asked. So when I buy a car, two years later, is the value of the car going to go up? The answer is no, right? The car value goes down or we understand the word depreciates, the value depreciates. So which means buying a car is not an investment, all right? Now some of you may be thinking, but there are antique cars, they sell for a lot, etc. They become antique only after a very, very long time and not every car model becomes antique, right? So those are some exceptional models, we're not gonna get into that. Generally, the normal cars that we are talking about, they are an asset, which means something you own, something you buy, you pay money and you own, but it's not an investment. Then I asked you the question about property. So when you buy land, when you buy an apartment, when you buy a house, is that an investment? Sure, right? You expect the value of the property to go up, right? You're hoping that it will go up in the future. The rents will go up, the selling price will go up. So will it, that's a different question. It could go down, it could go up, right? So an investment could give you a return, it could give you a loss, that's not in your hand. But your intention, when you're putting the money in that, is to make it grow. So by that definition, 
definitely uh, buying property, whether it's a house or an apartment or land, is an investment. Then I had an interesting question about differentiating between jewelry and gold. Uh, some of you may understand uh, some basic differences that when you go to sell jewelry, right, you don't get the exact value of the gold that you bought the jewelry for because there are some making charges in jewelry, there are some stones, etc., which don't really have the same value when you go to sell them, right? So it's only the gold value that you get. So when you look at jewelry, yes, it is an investment, but a pure investment in gold or a better investment in gold is directly through gold because in jewelry, you could lose some value. But nevertheless, it is an investment of sorts. Then I also asked you a question about fixed deposit. We'll answer that question in a little bit after I'm done with another point on this slide. So let's look at some of the other points on this slide. It says, it talks about risk. I'm sure we understand the word risk, we use it, but let's just put it a little bit into context. Risk means an uncertainty, something we are not sure of, something we can't predict what the outcome is going to be, right? So it says here on the slide that for savings, the risks are lower, and for investments, the risks are higher. I think that's obvious, right? In savings, the money is simply lying in an account or in your wallet or at home, right? You're not buying something whose value could go up or down. So that uncertainty of the price, whether that value is gonna go up or down, is missing here. There is a small concept, which again, we're gonna deal on with this slide. If some of you have that doubt in your head, hang on to it, but by and large, only if you buy in something, then you are exposed to the risk or the uncertainty of its price going up or down. And that risk is a lot higher, obviously, when you invest in something, as compared to when you're simply saving money, right? We've all heard this adage or this saying that higher the risk, higher the return, right? Now, is that a guaranteed equation? Is that something like if the risk in something is high, then I have to get a higher return? No. We expect to earn a higher return or we would take a higher risk only if we expect a higher in return in, uh, for that risk that we're taking, right? For example, if I have two options, low risk and high risk, somebody tells me, you take low risk, you'll get 10% return. You take high risk, you will still get 10% return. Will I ever opt for the high risk option? Never, it's a no brainer, right? I am getting 10% return in both the options, then why would I increase my risk? If somebody tells me you take low risk, 10% return, but you take high risk, there's a possibility, there's no guarantee, there's a possibility of a 25% return. Now some people, depending on something we call their risk appetite, the risk ability, right, which are terms we're not gonna get into in today's session. We may touch upon them briefly, but we're not gonna get into those details. But depending on their risk personality, somebody might say, no, 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 I'm okay with this 10% return because I don't wanna increase my risk. Somebody else might say, no, I want a risk of 25%, and in order to get that 25%, if it means taking a higher risk, so be it. So again, we understand that savings are lower risk and lower return, whereas investments are potentially higher risk and higher return. The next point on this slide says liquidity, okay? Slightly technical term, slightly technical term, just one second, Abdurrahman, if there are any questions or any comments, just let me know, because that I can't see on this. Yes. Thanks. Sorry about that. Regarding liquidity, liquidity means how easy or how close to cash is an asset. For example, if I've got coins and notes in my hand, Bahraini dinars and fills in my hand, that is already cash, right? There is no need for me to convert it into cash. It is immediate, instant cash. So that liquidity is the highest. So amongst the different things that we can have, for example, let's say I've got money, I've got gold, I've got a car, and I've got an apartment. These are the things that I own. These are my assets. Anything that I own is my asset, right? Now I want to get money in return for this assets. And I want to see which one is it easiest for me to get money quickly from. So cash is already cash. There is no question of how quick. It is already cash. So it is the most liquid thing that I have. I repeat that. So the most liquid asset that I have is cash because it is already cash. Now let's come to a car. If I talk about having a car and having an apartment, 
Which one is easier to sell? I want to sell my car or I want to sell my house. Which one is easier to sell? I'm sure most of you would agree that it is far easier to sell a car than selling a house, right? Maybe I'll be able to sell my car even in a day for all you know. I put an ad on OLX or any of the other platforms and maybe in a day I find a buyer and I sell my car. But I doubt it's so easy and so quick to sell your apartment or land or your house, right? Which means if I compare a car to a real estate property, a car is far more liquid an asset as compared to a real estate property. Now, let me add another point to this. Let's say I own an apartment whose market value right now is 50,000 BD. It's a one bedroom apartment, 50,000 BD. Okay, and I want to sell it urgently because I'm desperately in need for cash. The market price today, I already told you, is 50,000. Since I'm desperate, desperate for cash, any amount of cash, let's say I've got a very serious emergency, God forbid, right? I lower the price to something as ridiculous as 5,000 BD. I'm sure nobody's going to do that. I'm just giving you an example, right? 50,000 worth apartment, I put an ad for 5,000. Do you think it will take a week to sell? I'm sure all of you on this call are ready to buy it, right? It will sell in minutes, if not seconds. Why? Because I have reduced the price to something ridiculously low. So now somebody might say, so do you see real estate can also be liquid? Which means our definition is not complete. It is not simply, liquidity is not simply how fast you can get cash from selling an asset. It also has an added component, which is the ease of converting something to cash without an appreciable loss of value or at market value, right? So the value cannot be so low that it makes it, then, then that's not liquidity. So liquidity is at market value, at arm's length transactions, without any distressed sales, without any appreciable loss of value. If you are easily able to sell something and get cash for it, that means it is highly liquid. So your savings obviously are liquid because they're already cash there in your account. You go to the ATM, you withdraw your savings, you've got cash. But whatever you've invested in, depending on what you've invested in, it could be very liquid or it could be very illiquid, right? So for example, if I have gold, it's, easy, it's very easy to sell. If I have a car, it may not be so easy, but it's not too difficult either. But if I have a property, it may be difficult. If I have a property which is worth 10 million, it will be far more difficult than selling an apartment which is for 50,000, right? So different assets that you have will have different liquidity. That's the point on this slide. I hope that's clear, okay? The last point, an extremely important point, something which sometimes we disregard, we forget about, is regarding the impact of inflation. Before we read the points here, let me talk about what inflation is in very, very simple terms, not getting technical, right? Inflation is simply the measure of whether goods are becoming more expensive or not. So if something costed one dinar today, and that same product, same specifications, same everything, three months later the price has gone up to 2 BD, that means there has been an inflation in this. So if we look at it, if we look at things around us, they're getting more expensive, right? We say, right, five years back things were not so expensive. Now suddenly life has become very expensive. The cost of living has gone up. We say such things, right? All this is nothing but a result of inflation. So inflation is the buying power of money. What your 100 BD could buy, let's say, two years back, is it able to buy those same things today? Or is it able to buy more or less will tell you whether it's gone up, whether the prices have gone up or gone down. That's a measure of inflation. Which means, it brings us to a very important point and that, let me read it on the slide. On savings, it says, if savings are not paying any return, purchasing power will be reduced. Which means I've got 100 BD sitting in my bank account. I've saved money, right? So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling a little secure that I've got 100 BD in my account that I've saved. This can help me in the future. That 100 BD can buy me, let's say, 100 kilos of rice today because the price of rice today is one BD per kilo, let's say. So today it can buy me 100 kilos of rice. Now one year later, let's say the price of rice has become two dinars per kilo. Can that 100 BD buy me the same 100 kilos of rice that it was able to buy last year? The answer is obviously no. 
Now it can only buy me 50 kilos. So do you see the power of purchasing? The purchasing power of that money has become half. It has gone down. Whereas the absolute value, that 100 BD is still 100 BD. So my money has not gone anywhere. My savings is still intact. In fact, maybe there is some interest that I got from the bank. Maybe it's become 101 BD. So maybe the money has in, in fact increased from 100 to 101. But that's not the value of money, right? What is money? Money is a medium of transaction. We use it to buy stuff. I am not able to buy the same stuff that I was able to buy a year earlier with 100 BD. That means the power or the value of my savings has gone down. That is why, that is why we must understand what is investing. We must understand what is investing and all of us must in some capacity start investing because if you're not investing and you think you're saving money, you're not really growing your money. Your money is sitting there and slowly, slowly bleeding against the power of inflation. The amount of things it's going to be able to buy in the future is coming down as we go along because things are becoming expensive, right? If you look at the figures for Bahrain, I think the last I remember the inflation figures for Bahrain were 2 to 3 percent, something like that. But that's the inflation that has been calculated, that's st statistical inflation, right? The real inflation I'm sure is a little higher than that. We, we feel it a little higher than that, right? Are all our incomes and salaries increasing by that amount every year? Are we all getting 5 to 10 percent increments every year on our salaries? So that means my income is not necessarily increasing, but my costs are going up. So my savings are coming down anyway. Plus the savings that I have, the value of that saving is also coming down. So, uh, so you can clearly understand that there is a danger in you losing the power of what you can buy in the future with the money you have if you simply stick to investing, uh, sorry, saving, right? So we need to understand investing and we need to start seeing where are the opportunities for us in whatever capacity we have to invest money, right? Some of you will be thinking, but I only have a couple of thousand dinars. What will I be able to invest in a couple of thousand dinars? I can't buy a land in thousand dinars, right? Even if I go to buy gold, maybe I'll get a few grams. I don't understand stocks and mutual funds and bonds and all these things, so I really don't know what I can do with my 2000 BD. So let me just put it in a bank account or best, I have heard this FD thing, let me just put it in a fixed deposit, right? A lot of people have this thought process that the moment I have 50,000, 100,000, hundreds of thousands of dinars, that's when I'll become a full-time investor. I'll buy properties, I'll buy stocks, I'll start understanding these things, I'll go to banks and ask them what, this, what the solutions are, etc., etc. But until then, I'll just save my money until my money grows by saving to that 100,000. That's not going to happen, people. That's what we're here to understand. It's not going to happen. In fact, that money is not going to grow. It's going to erode. It's going to keep bleeding, and the value is going to keep coming down because of stuff like inflation. I hope that's clear. Let me read the other point on, on investing. If the investment return is lower than the inflation rate, purchasing power will be reduced. This is an important point which will answer one of the questions I asked earlier regarding fixed deposits. I asked you that if you have money in a fixed deposit, do you consider it an investment? In strict terms, yes, it is an investment because there is a certain return to a fixed deposit. So your money X is going to grow to X plus something, right, when the fixed deposit matures. But if that rate of return is not more than the rate of inflation, then your value of the money has just come down. Let me make it a little simpler. I put 1000 BD in a fixed deposit. Okay, let's say there was a 2% return. So that became, what's 2% of uh, 1000? Is it 2000? No, right, that's 100% increase. Okay, leave the calculators, just listen to me, the numbers are not important. Well, let's stick to the percentages, it's easier to understand. Okay, so if there's a 2% return that I get on my fixed deposit, and in the same time, let's say the fixed deposit was for two years, in the same time, in those two years, the inflation rate has been 4%. So the value of my money because of the fixed deposit investment has gone up by 2%, but 
what is it that my money can buy? That value has gone down by 4% because of inflation. So net, net, I have lost 2% on my money despite me thinking that I have invested it in a fixed deposit. This is something which a lot of people don't understand. Now you may be asking then why do people invest in fixed deposits in the first place? If it's so simple to understand and if it's something everyone can understand the way we've understood now, why would anyone want to put any money in a fixed deposit? The answer is very simple, something I mentioned earlier, it's all about risk. Fixed deposit is one of the least risky avenues available to invest your money in. So it comes down to how you are in terms of risk management, in terms of your risk appetite. Some people have absolutely no appetite for risk. And they might say, the max I'm going to do is I'm going to put my money in an FD, right? And we're going to talk about that in the next few slides. So let me move on to the next slide. I hope you're all clear on this slide. It's a very important slide, which is why I spent some time on it, because it's got a lot of basic concepts on it. If you have any questions, please put them on the chat. And my, um, I've got a team helping me out here who will tell me what the questions are and I'll answer them. Or you can hang on to your questions till the end when we have our Q&A session. Let me also remind you I'm going to have three questions at the end of the session. And each question will have one lucky winner. The first person with the correct answer will get some exciting prizes courtesy BIBF. Okay? I'm going to move to the next slide. Okay, you see this gentleman on the slide, some of you may recognize him, and for the others, he's a very famous investor, very famous uh, person, very famous investment guru. His name is Warren Buffet, and some of his, uh, some of the stuff he has said or written are as good as guidelines to investment, right? Let's look at some of the things, some of the interesting things that he talks about. So the first one he says, Never depend on a single income. Make investments to create a second source. And the explanation given is create multiple sources of income. And I'm sure in today's times of corona, right, where there is so much uncertainty with respect to businesses especially, and even the salaried sector, right, where there is so much of uncertainty, a lot of us have this thought in our head that we should have had a second source of income. We would have felt a lot more secure, right? Now that second source of income could be many things. It's very difficult to have two full-time jobs, right? I think it's impossible. I don't even think it's allowed by the labor law in Bahrain, right? So two full-time jobs, not possible. So I could have a full-time job and a part-time job, but is that physically possible for all of us to have a full-time eight-hour job and then again go and do some part-time job? It's not easy, right? Second option, maybe I have a business on the side and some of us are actually doing it very well. Another option could be I have some investment which is giving me some stream of money coming in. So there are various ways people can have multiple incomes, but that's a principle that Warren Buffet advocates and that's something we should all start thinking towards. You need to find your own way what suits you best, but try and create multiple sources of income. Second, very interesting, I love this one, it's one of my favorite. Where he says, do not save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after saving, right? I want you to reread that and try to see what it means. Do not save what is left after spending, which means I just, I get my salary, 1000 BD. I spend, 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 spend. In the end, I realize I've got 100 BD left, so that's my saving. Because at the end of the month, what I've got left is 100 BD, so that is my saving. But what Mr. Warren is saying is no. Change the way you look at it. You've got a salary of 1000 BD. You decide what amount of saving practically possible and what is your target towards what you want to save from that month or in a year or in five years, etc. you work it backwards. So let's say I decide I want to save 250 every month. So that means my saving needs to be 250 out of 1000. So I've got to live my month in 750 BD. Now how is, I need to find a way. I've got to make it happen. Whether it means cutting down my rent, so moving to a place where I can afford that kind of rent, buying you know, a car which is not as expensive as the one that I wish for, cutting down on the money I spend on some of the things that I can cut down on, etc., etc. right? That is what Mr. Warren advocates. I repeat this point, do not save what is left after spending. Instead, spend what is left after saving, okay? Third point, do not 
put all your eggs in one basket. We've all heard this, I'm sure. Most of us have heard this line. Maybe you don't know it was this gentleman who said it. But do not put all your eggs in one basket means don't invest all your money. Money is called funds as well. So funds on the slide means money. Don't invest all your money into one single investment. Now let's understand what this means and why not, right? So in, I'll just use a technical term here and I'll explain it. We talk about something called diversification, dividing, diversifying your risk. It's, it's all about risk. If you put all your money in one basket, in one instrument, which means all my money in one property, I have 50,000 worth of savings, I go and I buy a land. I have no other money to invest anywhere else. The only investment in my life that I have is that land. What happens if the real estate market crashes? The only investment I had was that land and its value, let's say, became half. So I have exposed myself to a risk because of concentrating all my wealth, all my money in one instrument, right? In one basket. I put my eggs into one basket, only into real estate. So that is what this point is saying, that try and diversify try and invest in different opportunities with different risks and different returns so that if one, ha if one is going through a bad time, there may be another investment which is going through a good time and the returns from that investment compensate or make up for the losses for from the other investment. Great, I'm just trying to look at some of the comments here. No questions yet, awesome. Okay, uh, the last point, never test the depth of the river with both the feet. So I'm sure if you try and visualize this, you'll be able to understand this point. If I'm stepping into water and I'm not sure how deep it is, right? Am I just gonna jump in with both feet or I'm gonna stand where I'm sure where I am right now, that okay, I can feel the ground. Now let me put one step forward and see how, how low or how deep does it go. And then when I'm okay with that, then I put my other foot to that level and then take it forward. That's how we all test the depth of water, right? Whether it's in a pool, of course in a pool, some of them, we can most of the time see the depth, but if it's in the sea, then that is how we test the depth, right? We go foot by foot. So same way, when it comes to taking risks and investment, build up your risks gradually, right? Don't just jump into something which you don't understand or where the risks are so high in one step, immediately. For example, uh, let me take a great, uh, a very good example of cryptocurrencies, right? It's a very hot term these days. Cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum, so many, so many cryptos, right? Today, at least today, we understand or some of us understand a lot more about cryptocurrencies than we probably understood a few, uh, few years back. A few years back, it was just a buzzword. Everyone was saying cryptos, 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 right? And because everyone was talking about it, it was a buzzword, people said, you know what, let me just blindly go ahead and buy Bitcoin. I'm not saying, please understand whatever I'm talking about today, I'm not saying right or wrong, right? We're trying to understand some principles. So I'm not saying anyone who bought cryptocurrencies then made a wrong investment, no. Maybe they did right, but the rationale is what we're trying to understand. Was the rationale where they were in control of how much of their wealth they invested? Did they invest only in one asset? Did they diversify? That is what we are here to understand. Once you understand the principles, your investment style is personal to you, right? You have your risk appetite, you have your risk goals, which are also equally important. Somebody may only have a goal of 50,000. I just need to make 50,000 and that's it. Somebody wants 50 million, right? Somebody wants to buy a house and a car and secure his children's education. Somebody doesn't have kids. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Different people have different uh, financial goals or financial ambitions, and according to that, their investment profiles will change. Reading a comment, Hussain says, Warren Buffet doesn't like diversification. He likes concentration on few securities and sticking onto them. That's a great point, Hussain, and thank you for your comment. When you say he likes concentration on few securities and stick onto them, I want you to go ahead and check if all those securities are from the same industry. For example, all the security that he buys in or all the securities that he advocates, are they all from, let's say, the auto industry? Or are they all from the IT industry? Or are they all from the for pharma industry? I can guarantee you that's not the answer. There's no way that all the avenues or all the stocks or all the securities that he talks about or he invests in himself are from the same industry, not necessarily. 
right? It will not be, it will not be the case. You will see that there are different industries, so the risk will be distributed across industries. Okay, I hope that answers your doubt. Uh, thank you for your comment, and please, if you have any more comments, please do keep them coming in. Okay, let me move on to the next slide. Now, talking about some of the key investment principles, I'm going to go a little quicker on this slide because this is more guidelines. It's more of read and understand. Identify your investment objectives to be able to realistically determine your target return and level of risk appetite. I spoke about this in, in a way in the last couple of minutes, right? That everyone has different investment objectives. First step is understand what is your objective. Is it to buy a house? Is it only to secure your future and your kids' future in terms of you and your wife living in a house and your kids' education? Is it something else? Is it I want to leave my kids with a million dollars before I die? So whatever is your financial goal, or maybe I need to settle my mortgage my home loan that I have, right? I want to make sure I don't have any loans on me. So we could all have many, many different financial goals. The first step talks about identifying very clearly what your investment and what your financial goals are, okay? Second point, higher risk investments should yield higher returns. Otherwise, it is not worth investing in risky investments if investors are not compensated with higher return. I spoke of this as well, that it does not mean that higher risk equals to higher return, no. But we should take higher risks only if there is a potential. I use the word potential. If there is a potential for higher returns. If there is no potential for higher returns, then there is no point in taking the higher risk. That's just rank foolishness, right? The next point. Diversification of investment amongst security classes is key to spreading the risks among different products. I just spoke about this in relation to the answer that I gave to Hussain's point where diversification is key, which means distributing your risks. That distribution could be in many ways. It could be across instruments. That means I want to put some money in gold, I want to put some money in real estate, some in stock, some, I some emergency expenditures, right? It might even be diversification in terms of the industries. I am uh, putting all my money in only the IT industry because I am an IT professional and I understand IT. I really understand how Google works, how Apple works, how IBM works. I am able to very clearly understand which of these stocks is going to work and not. Sure, you may be, but understand there's no one, no one, absolutely no one, who's capable of timing the market correctly, consistently, which means even if you understand a particular industry and you only invest in that industry, you're exposing yourself to some serious risk because you have only one industry exposure. So diversification could also be in terms of industry. It could be in terms of geography. Some people only invest in the Middle East because this is my region. I'm from Bahrain. I understand Bahrain. I understand Saudi, Oman, Emirates, right? I don't understand Brazil. I don't understand China, Russia, India, Australia. I'm not going to invest there. So by investing in only the Middle East region, you've got a geographic concentration. So your risk is with respect to this region. Something goes wrong in this region, and if this region crashes in terms of price, economy, etc., then your portfolio, which is strictly concentrated on this region, suffers a huge loss. So there's diversification in region as well. And there's so many other things which I'm not going to get into right now, right? Number four, invest only in securities or companies that you know about to determine the key factors that affect different investments. So this talks about having a bit of knowledge, right? Don't blindly invest because somebody else is investing or just because you read about something. You should have some understanding, some knowledge of what you're going to invest, invest in, okay? Do not rely on a single source of information when assessing an investment opportunity. Making investment decisions based only on credit rating reports without proper due diligence is ill advice. Related to the previous point, just one article. I just read one article where the headline says, we expect this company to double its profits in the next two years. Now, I have no clue what this company was, what industry, how big are they, what was their last five years history, who their CEO is, who their management is, what are their current plans. I know nothing. I just saw this headline and I thought, let me just go ahead and buy stocks. Or gold prices expected to hit a new high in the next three months. Somewhere I read it. Is that a credible source? 
There are so many other articles, I'm sure, on gold. There are so many views. Instead of contrasting, and what is the reason? What is the logic? Does it make sense? No, I just go ahead and buy gold. I take a position in gold because I expect it on the basis of this article to reach whatever new high in three months. No, this is very, very risky. It can work out. Any of these things can work out, but it could be pure luck, right, as compared to diligence. So diligence, the word diligence that is used here means doing something carefully by paying attention to details, OK? Last point, periodically review your investment performance and decisions to determine what went right or wrong as lessons for future investment decisions. As with anything, there is a learning curve in investment as well, which is why we spoke about this point on the previous slide that do not test the depth of the water with both feet. Go gradually, because if we are new investors, there's a lot to learn. If we are experienced investors, there is still a lot to learn. We all make mistakes. As with everything in investment, you learn from your mistakes and you uh, adapt your approach accordingly. So you must review your investment portfolio performance periodically, time to time, whether it's three months, quarterly, six months, yearly, whatever it is, and change your plans accordingly. Okay, let me move on to the next slide. Again, I'm gonna go a little quick on this slide because this slide is only a guideline, it's not a rule. It will differ from individual. It'll be different for me, different for you, different for someone with kids, without kids, depending on the age of their kids, their age, their career, where in their career they are right now, how much money do they have, how much money have they saved, what is their net worth, so many things can decide where you are in this slide. So even though it says that if you are between 31 and 50, that means you are in a stage of career growth. It's not necessary, right? There could be people who are between 31, who, let's say 32 years old. There could be someone who's 32 years old who's already made 100 million in his life. He's set for life. He's done it, right? And there could be someone who still has no career at all. He's still struggling, right? So these are guidelines, but what it's trying to say is trying to give you an indication that most of the people who are between 22 and 30, right, their focus now more than investment is on savings because they've just started earning. They started small, they just started earning, right? So they have, plus this is the age where you've got so many things you want to spend money on as well. So possibly the focus is more on savings, if at all, if there is a focus, it should be there. And then small investments, minor investments, right? Because your main focus is on your job. You want to grow in your career. You want to reach a certain position. That's the age where we all are trying our best to focus on our career. Also, when you're young, you have a higher risk-taking capacity because, not just because of age, but also because your responsibilities, in most cases, are less, right? Either you're just married, not married, or definitely you've got maybe smaller kids or no kids because you're just married or not married at all in most cases in that age group, right? So your responsibilities are less. If your responsibilities are less, it means your risk-taking appetite is a lot higher. If your responsibilities are high, not necessarily that every will be, everybody will be comfortable taking risks. Some people might be a little scared to take risks when their responsibilities are high. So, so on and so forth, if you look at the other tables, it shows you how a person who's aged between 31 and 50, who's in a career growth stage, how a person who's between 51 and 60, who's just almost reaching retirement, pre-retirement, how do they think? What is their investment objective versus what is their risk appetite? Then finally, someone who's above 60. This slide is in no way telling you that this is how you need to be. I wanna make that very clear. This slide is not telling you that find where you are. If you're 28 years right now, you need to be in the first column. If you're 55 years right now, you need to be in the third column, which means your risk appetite needs to be moderate. Your investment objective needs to be so and so. Safeguarding capital. No, this is not what the meaning of this slide is. This is telling you most people in that age bracket, in that life cycle, behave like this. You will decide your behavior depending on your circumstances, which means you know where you are in your career. You know how stable your income is, you know how many responsibilities, how many dependents you have, you know what your investment goals are, what your liabilities are, what your assets are, and on the basis of all of this, and as a person, you have a certain character, personality as well, you know what your risk-taking ability, risk-taking capacity, risk-taking appetite is, on the basis of all of this, you will fit in one of these. And that is purely your decision, okay? Moving on to the next slide, this slide, takes us to a little bit of technical terms that I told you at the beginning. I'll talk about asset classes and asset allocation. So after all we spoke about, a question that people may have is, okay, 
what I understood so far is that I should be investing my money because simply saving money might reduce the value of my money. I understood that so far. Now the next question is, where should I invest my money? There are 100 things people talk about. Where should I invest? So let us understand what are those 100 things that people talk about. Is there a certain category? Can we look at those categories in a different way? Is there a certain risk and return in a certain category? And then there's a different risk and return in another category. Let's understand that a little bit, right? So dividing all these instruments and all these options into categories on the basis of some common characteristics, that is what asset classes are. So asset classes are different categories. That word classes means categories. So you can even say asset categories, but commonly what we, the term we use is asset classes. So asset classes are categories of those assets which, which behave similarly in terms of liquidity, in terms of risk and reward. So let's look at it. The first asset class, which means the first column that we have is cash, notes and coins, current accounts, savings account, fixed deposits, or we can simply say cash and cash equivalents. Why? If you remember what I spoke about earlier, all of these are extremely liquid. That's, that's the right answer. For all, of those, for all of you who said the word liquid in your head, pat on the back because you've been following this lecture. These are highly liquid, which means they're either already cash or the possibility of converting them into cash without losing value is very high. But we also understood that if they are highly liquid and if the risk is low, then the, risk, the return is also very low. So this is an asset class, liquid, low risk, low return. We move to the next asset class, fixed income. As the word should explain, fixed income, the income you can receive from these instruments is fixed. I know how much income I will get, whatever, monthly, quarterly, half yearly, annually, but I know it is only this much. It's fixed. And you have stuff like bonds and money market instruments. I'm not going to go into the details of what is a bond, what is a money market instrument, because that is slightly advanced. You can Google and read up on it. But we are here to understand only what, is, what asset classes are and what asset allocation is. Next is equities. We understand more commonly the term stocks. So stocks or shares, as we say, share of a company, stock of a company, that is nothing but equity. Okay? Just to compare between a bond and an equity, if I buy a share of a company, do I know how much money I'm going to get every month or every quarter or every year? One, the answer is I don't know. It depends on whether the company performs or not. Secondly, even if it performs, it depends on whether they're going to return any money in the form of a dividend or not. Third, that money is not going to be a regular source of income. It will probably be a semi-annual or an annual payment, right? So that is why it is not called fixed income because it's not fixed. Whereas bonds, it's different. When you read, you'll understand. There's a fixed source of income that you will receive every six months or every year, etc. Anything that you can't classify in any of these three. If you can't put, for example, you ask me gold. Is gold as good as cash? The answer is no. Because I may have to sell the gold at a loss. That means it doesn't fill the definition of liquidity. Because when I go to sell gold, I might lose value by the time I sell. Because gold prices change so often and it's, it's not something I can just sell like that, right? So it can't come under cash and cash equivalents. Is it a fixed income? No. Is it a stock or a share? No. So it's not under equities. So anything that doesn't fall under these three classes automatically comes under the next class, which is alternative instruments. So you've got stuff like real estate. You've got stuff like mutual funds, commodities. Commodities includes stuff like gold, oil, uh, your natural resources, right? So gold, oil, cotton, metals, etc. All this will come under commodities. Alternatives is the category which has one of the least liquidities, so higher risk and potential of higher return. So all these categories, you can see the liquidity is different and the risk is different and the potential return is different. There's a last column mentioned as insurance, right? Where there is a lot of debate. Is it an investment? Is it not? Some people consider insurance as a hybrid form of investment. Some people don't consider in investment as a uh, uh, sorry, insurance as an investment, because if you look at life insurance, when you die, somebody else benefits. So you're not the one who's benefiting, right? It's somebody else, the beneficiary, who's benefiting from your insurance policy. So there are different schools of thoughts. So let's park insurance. Insurance, you can take one sentence from this class that insurance could be an investment and may not be an investment, okay? So you park insurance there. It's a complicated topic to understand. We'll concentrate on the others, which is there are different asset classes, 
depending on liquidity, which we've understood, depending on risk, which we've understood, and depending on potential return, which also we've understood. So cash and cash equivalents, fixed income, equities, and alternative instruments. The last term that I wanted to talk about was asset allocation. It means, allocation means to decide how much to put where. So asset allocation means if I've got a pot of money, let's say my pot of money is 20,000 BD, I want to invest 20,000 money. That's my investment portfolio. How much am I gonna put in which pot? In which asset class? That is my asset allocation. So if I decide 10,000, I'm gonna keep it in cash. My risk taking appetite is very, very low. So I wanna keep it very liquid. So 10,000, 50% of my portfolio is gonna be cash. Out of the remaining 50%, I want to take 80% out of that remaining 50% into high risk. So I go and buy real estate or I buy gold, alternative. And the remaining I'll put it in shares, equities. So that's my asset allocation. I put 50% here, 30% somewhere else, 20%. This percentage, there is no right or wrong, purely depends on your capacity, your appetite, and your goals. All these things we've discussed. So it will differ from person to person. So that process of deciding how much to invest where, that is what is called asset allocation. I hope that's clear. I'm gonna take a 30 seconds pause to see if there are any questions. If you have any questions, please type them in before I move on to the next slide. So Azeen or Aziz, I think that is, has asked what is a mutual fund? So Aziz, a mutual fund is an instrument which we call as a collective instrument. Okay, I'll explain it in very simple terms. I won't go financial, I'll try and explain in a very simple manner. Where I am a financial smart person, I've got the brains, and there are 10 people in front of me who've got money. They necessarily don't have finance brains. They're very smart in their own jobs, in their own fields, but they don't understand finance. They don't understand investment. I understand investments. I'm telling them, you give me your money, I'm gonna collect your money, take all this money, I understand where to invest it and make money. I'm gonna take this money and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this money and put some in this country, in this uh, company, or in gold, or in oil. I'm gonna make money for you. I'm gonna give you a return on your money, and in return, I'm gonna take a fees, or a commission, or a percentage. That's what a mutual fund is. So mutually, we decide that you give me your money, I'm gonna combine all your money, and I'm gonna use this money as my money now, I'm gonna invest it somewhere, and I'll give you a return. Can I guarantee you a return? No. I'll try my best not to make a loss. I'll tell you everything, all the details of where I'm gonna spend this money, how I'm gonna invest, what's my strategy, etc., etc. And if I make a profit out of that, this will be your share and this will be my fees or my commission. That's a very simple way of understanding what a mutual fund is. Now, what does this mutual fund buy in? There are different themes, which means there could be a mutual fund which specializes only in investing in gold. It could be a gold fund. There could be a mutual fund which specializes in certain countries. There is something called as a BRIC fund. Brit, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. It only invests in these four markets, etc., etc. Okay, it's a huge topic. I hope that answers the question. Hussain also says cash is trash. It's always eaten by inflation. Very good. That's a very great point you make, Hussain. It's something I spoke about at length. You're absolutely right. Cash gets eaten by inflation. Moving on to one of the last slides. I'm going to introduce you to the Bahrain Bourse. I'm sure some of you have have a fair idea of what the Bahrain Bourse is. I hope all of you know where the Bahrain Bourse is. Does anyone know where the Bahrain Bourse is? Can anyone quickly put it on chat? Where is the Bahrain Bourse? Is it in Durat al-Bahrain? Is it in Diyar al-Muharraq? Financial Harbor says Fatima Mahroz. Okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is at the Financial Harbor. You see that huge sign when you're driving past the Financial Harbor where you see all those numbers and figures going by, that is the Bahrain Bourse. It's the Bahrain Stock Exchange, right? And let's read a little bit about it. So the Bahrain Bourse, or the BHB, was established in 1989. So it was started in 1989. It's a very young bourse compared to some of the other countries. And now it has over 50 companies quoted, which means you can buy and sell, you can trade shares of these companies on the Bahrain Bourse, these 50 countries, right? I request you to go to their website, read up on it, see, right? All trades that take place, they are through registered brokers and they use the exchange's automated trading system. Some of this is highly technical, don't worry about it. 
Now, what kind of things can you buy and sell on the boards? What are the products that they have? What are the instruments? We talked about instruments, in instruments, right? Investment instruments. What are they? You can buy and sell shares, which is stocks or equities. You can buy and sell bonds or sukuks. Sukuks is nothing but the Islamic version of bonds. So you've got conventional banking and Islamic banking. A conventional banking product is bonds. The same kind of a product on the Islamic side is a sukuk. Okay? And you can buy and sell mutual funds. Then you've got T-bills. T-bills are a form of bonds. Again, I'm not going to get into the technicality. And there is another uh, specialized product called REIT. It's a very interesting product, real investment uh, related, uh, sorry, real estate related product. It's kind of a modified uh, mutual fund called as a REIT. Okay. The objectives of the Bahrain boss very simple. They want to develop the trading market in Bahrain, the securities market in issuing and trading, so companies can register on the Bahrain boards and they can sell their shares and people who buy can then later on sell it to somebody else or they can buy it from somebody else. This exchange or the Bahrain boards is like the medium or the platform on which all of this can happen. Okay. Some of the other objectives are given on the slide to develop and rationalize trading methods of the exchange, to establish and promote ties and links with the other Arab and international security exchange markets, to ensure saving and further citizen investment awareness, to oversee the organization and regulation of securities trading on the market, provide the necessary finance for supporting the requirements of economic and social development. Now, the reason we're talking about Bahrain Bourse is because most of the people have a tendency to invest first in their own country because they understand their country the best, right? I understand Bahrain more than I understand any other country. I'm born and brought up here, right? I'm Bahraini, originally from India, but never been to India, born and brought up here. So I only understand the Bahrain market, maybe the Middle East market. I do not understand the Indian companies and the Indian market. So if I have to invest, I may invest in the Middle East market ahead of the Indian market because I understand I know companies firsthand. I know Alba. I have seen the history of Alba. I've seen Alba for the last 20 years, right? I have a fair idea of what Alba has been. Is it a growing company? Is it a progressing company? Does it have potential to remain one of the biggest companies in Bahrain? Whereas if you take a big company's name from India, I may not know the history of that company. I'll just have to go by news, right? Here in your own country, in addition to the news, you know a lot more. You sometimes even know people who are in senior positions. So you have a lot more confidence in that market in terms of knowledge. I'm not saying in terms of returns because maybe there are better returns in other markets, in other companies. Of course, there will be higher return potentials in companies like Google, right? Can there be any company in Bahrain which can compete with, say, a Google or an Apple or an IBM or Tesla or anything? Obviously not, right? But do I understand that market? Do I understand those stocks? Do I understand those companies? Maybe not, okay? Lastly, um, there is this link. So we are coming to the end of today's session. There is this link which talks about some videos which will give you more details about what we are uh, going to, what we've covered, right? If you need more knowledge, because what I've covered is just a first step. Some of you have gotten a very basic idea. You need to know more stuff. These are the links, there are videos. On top of the videos, if you're interested in learning more about investments, the last slide, which I'm showing you now, which has the BIBF Investment Academy. There are some very healthy courses as part of the Investment Academy in the BIBF, which I strongly recommend all of you interested in investing to log into and, oh uh, no, can, I, can we go forward please? One more. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. I think you can see the slide now. The Investment Academy of BIBF. Even if you don't have time now to take on these details, just call the help desk at BIBF and they'll be sure to guide you if you need courses on investing. Uh, bottom line, just to summarize before I come to the Q&A and before I come to the quiz, what we've talked about today is we've understood the difference between saving and investing. Most of us are trying our best to save money. Some of us or many of us are saving money. But the question that we've tried to answer today is how many of us are actually investing the money that we've saved? How many of us have that investing mentality? And how many of us only have a spending or a saving mentality? And what is the danger in being there? Is there a danger in only having a saving mentality? Should I have an investment mentality? And why? What happens to the money if I'm only saving it and I'm not investing it? What are the risks if I'm, if I'm going to invest money? Are there any risks or is there only return? If I invest money in say A, B or C or D, is the risk the same everywhere? Is the return the same everywhere? 
right? These are the kind of questions we've attempted to answer today. We spoke about asset classes. We understood that there are different asset classes. They are identified in terms of liquidity, in terms of risk and return. We also understood that the return in different asset classes is different, so I must allocate my funds accordingly, right? And lastly, we understood that all of this depends on my personal investment objectives, my personal investment risk-taking capacities, and all of this put together gives rise to our investment plan. I hope that makes sense to you, and I hope all of us start thinking about how to invest money, first how to save money, and then of course, how to invest money. I am now gonna look at the screen and see if you have any questions for me. So last three minutes for Q&A before we move to the quiz. So don't go away because I have three questions. And the first answers I see on the screen, those are the names I'm gonna take down and pass on to BIBF. And they will, I'm told, I think it's a cash prize, uh, which the first correct answer to each question will get. So if you have any questions, please post them. I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes. Anissa Mtiaz asks, first step on how to invest. Can anybody answer her? We've talked about it in this presentation. Can anyone help Anissa? Maybe she joined late, maybe she missed that slide. Can anyone answer the question? What is the first step on how do we invest? So Anissa, the first thing is to understand yourself. And that includes understanding your capacity, right? your capability and your risk appetite and also your investment goals. So first is, what is your investment goal? Is it in five years I want to have a house? Is it in 10 years my kids are gonna be 18 years old so I need to have their education secure? What is your investment goal? Identify that, second, quantify that, which means put a number to it. I wanna buy a house, that house could be 50,000, could be 100,000, could be 500,000. Right? And then according to that identification and quantification of the number, you work backwards to your plan. Great, I hope that's answered. I don't see any more questions, so I'm gonna to move to the quiz. Okay. So I announce who the winner is on the call itself. We're gonna to move to the quiz. I hope everyone is ready. I will remind you, the moment I've said the question, the first answer I see on the screen, if it's correct, the first correct answer is going to be the winner. So if there are 10 people who've answered correctly, whosoever answer appears in the chat box first, that answer is what we will take as the winner. So there's one winner per question. I hope that's clear. And I hope all of you are ready. Good luck to you. Question number one. Can you please name any three instruments that are listed on the Bahrain Bourse? I repeat, can you please list any three types of investment instruments that are listed on the Bahrain Bourse? I need complete answers in one sentence and I see some answers coming in. We've got a team that's sitting here to judge who the correct answer is and they're gonna tell me very soon who the winner of the first uh, uh, prize for the first question is. Wow, that's a lot of answers. It's good to see that so many of you are paying attention because I can see a lot of correct answers. It looks like all your answers are correct but unfortunately the first uh, answer that came in correct is going to be the winner and and the winner for the cash prize from BIBF for the first question is Mr. Muhammad Anwar. Congratula congratulations Muhammad Anwar. You have won the first questions prize. Courtesy Bahrain Bourse and BIBF, my apologies. The prizes are sponsored by both the Bahrain Bourse and BIBF. For all of you who have answered correctly, congratulations, and don't worry, there are two more questions. I hope you're ready for the second question. Question number two. Under which asset class 
would you classify real estates? I repeat, under which asset class would you classify or put real estate? So I don't know who's first because I saw so many answers coming in. I will wait for the judges to tell me that. But what I can tell you is REITs is not the correct answer. REITs is a type of avenue in which you can invest if you want exposure to real estate. But that is not a name of an asset class. It's a product. The asset class is alternative investments or alternatives or alternative. Uh, any of those answers are correct. Anyone who said alternative alternatives or alternative investments is correct, but I shall wait on the decision regarding who the first person was. Again, thank you for paying attention. Lots and lots of correct answers. Good job. I hope you're ready for the third question, which is probably the trickier question of the three. But first, let me tell you who has won the prize courtesy Bahrain Bourse and VIVF. The winner of the second prize is Iqra Safdar. Congratulations, Iqra, on winning the prize from Bahrain Bourse and VIVF for the second question. Awesome stuff. The rest of you, don't lose hope. There's still one last question before we sign off for tonight. The last question is, and this is a tricky one, you really need to have paid attention to the slides. In which year was Bahrain Bourse established? In which year was Bahrain Bourse established? Okay, I see a lot of years coming in. And I see a lot of correct and wrong answers coming in. So some people have just guessed the answer. It was on the slides. The correct answer is 1989. So let's see who was the first person with the right answer. Most of you have put in the right answer 1989. Some of you got confused and say 1987. Then there are some other answers which are pretty far away. There's 2087. Mahmoud, you're in the future, my friend, 2087. I'm sure it's a typo. I know that. <laughs> it was supposed to be 1987. I'm just kidding. The first person to answer correctly, which is So apparently there's a typo, it should have been 1987, but the slide says 1989, which means all those who've, ri who've written 1987 have obviously Googled it and not paid attention to the presentation, which is fine. And I am just about to find out who the winner of the last prize for tonight is. Ahmed, sorry, I do not have any more questions. I have a lot of questions. I can stay here for another ask, hour and ask questions, but no more prizes. And the winner of the last question for the night is, you're right, Ali. Ali al saghir you're absolutely right. It is Anisa. Sorry, what's your full name? Anisa Safdar? Imtiaz. Imtiaz. Anisa Imtiaz. Congratulations to all three winners. Please contact uh, Bahrain Bors on their Instagram. Just DM them and they will get in touch with you for the prizes. I have also communicated the names to them, but I also request you to get in touch with them. Yes, Anisa wrote 1989. That's the year I have on the slide and we are going to go by the slide because I was 
talking from the slides. And you're right, Ahmad, it is actually 1987. But since the material had 1989, we're going to consider that for the prize. And I think that's fair because the questions are supposed to check how much attention you were paying in the, in the program, right? So thank you. I hope you had a great time. I hope you learned something. I had a good time interacting with you. Stay safe, everyone, and good luck with your investing. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your weekend. Maasalama.